Amen. Amen. Would you take your Bibles, open them to two places. Hebrews chapter 11, where we'll pick up in verse 24. Hebrews chapter 11 and Jeremiah chapter 18. Hebrews 11, Jeremiah 18. In our verse by verse study in the book of Hebrews, we are in the hall of faith. And today's message I've entitled, By Faith, Moses Chose the Eternal. By Faith, Moses Chose the Eternal. Notice with me Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So mark that word refused. It's an important beginning in our study today. He refused. Something was offered to him and he refused it straight up. Verse 25, choosing, so mark that word, refusing and choosing, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. And then here's the third word I want you to mark, esteeming, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. So we have refused, choosing, and esteeming. Now we're studying the life of Moses because we're in this section in Hebrews chapter 11. This is the journey that we're on, looking at what's known as the hall of faith. Not the hall of failure, but the hall of faith. It's so encouraging to us. Men and women, just like you and me, growing by faith. Now, they're just like you and me, but also they're not like you and me because they had far less, they had far less than what we have today. They were living under what's known as the old covenant. They were living under the system of Judaism. Now, up to this point that all that we've been studying have been living in a place of a different a covenant with God. They had a different arrangement in their relationship with God. We now, on this side of the cross, we live in what's known as the new covenant. And we live with the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. We have the completed Bible so that we have it in writing, God's character and his nature and what's required of us, what God is doing in us. And they made it into the hall of faith, not for their failures, but for their faith. And because they made it in, we too will make it in. And I, I love Moses here because Moses, Moses' life was covered in faith even before he was born. At conception, he was conceived in a faith-filled family, challenged beyond measure. His family, slaves in every sense of that word in Egypt. No longer do they have their, their relationship with, through Joseph and the success of generations. But there arose a Pharaoh that forgot all about Joseph, didn't know him. And he oppressed the nation of Israel. He, he oppressed the children of God and made them slaves and built cities in Egypt through them. All that they accomplished, all that they had, all the things that were given to them were taken away from them. They how, now have nothing. And their relationship is to do what they're told, working day and night to build and to work for Pharaoh. But Moses, he was born into a family of faith. Despite what they faced, they were still people of faith. I mean, you, you think of Moses' life. His life started out with a death threat in the womb. There was a death threat from the government in the womb that said, any male babies, when they're born and you determine they're a male, kill them. Don't let them live. And when that didn't work, he, Pharaoh then said, throw all the male babies into the river. I don't want them here. And yet, you had the faith of the midwives that said, no way. Baby boy, we're not going to give them to Egypt. And didn't we learn that, parents? We're learning that in these successive studies. Our kids are not going to be given to Egypt. We're not giving our kids away. We're not just going to let them flail through life and try to make it. We're not going to let this culture and world system corrupt the kids. We're going to teach them and disciple them and pour into them the love, the mercy, the grace, the truth, the word of God into their hearts. We're going to pour into them and teach them about God and about the love of God. So you had the midwives. Then you had the parents that once the baby was born, they're like, you know, we got to hide him. So they made that little basket, covered it in pitch, and put Moses out into the water in the reed, reed area of the Nile River, and then waited to see what God might do. 
Remember that when you're reading the Bible, everybody is, is experiencing this in real time. So we know the whole story. We know beginning to end. We can read through the book of Exodus. We know what happened in Moses' life. But at the time it happened, Moses, well, of course he's a baby, but Moses, his parents, his sister, the midwives, they don't know what's going to happen. They're just living it out. And so if you can imagine just putting your baby into a basket and putting him into the reeds, hiding him and keeping him out and not being able to be like that, it was a hard life. Challenging, separated so early living in fear and anxiety. Well, you know, as we looked last time, Pharaoh and and those that served her went out to the Nile. They they found the basket, saw there was a baby in there, and it says Pharaoh's daughter had compassion. Isn't that great? It's so encouraging to me that God had already built into this girl a compassionate heart. She doesn't know the one true God. She doesn't care about the one true God. She lives in the lap of luxury. Everything a girl would ever want, she has. But God had made her. And she doesn't know yet that God put eternity into her heart. She doesn't know yet of anything that is still yet to be learned. And yet, when she found out that was a Hebrew baby and that Hebrew baby was a boy, she decides to save his life. And there are just, there are people in this world that although they're not born again, God has touched their hearts. And God has put into them character. God has given them, or at least they they have been raised in such a way where they're moral and they're right there. Now, never forget, morality doesn't save a person, but morality is a good thing. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with good people. But good people still need to be saved. And so here's Pharaoh's daughter. No, we're, we're not going to get rid of this baby. We're gonna, I'm going to take care of her. And then what happens? All of a sudden, Moses' sister shows up. Do you need somebody? Do you need somebody to take care of this baby? I can find somebody. Yes, please find somebody. So what does she do? She goes home to mom. Hey, mom, you wouldn't believe it. This is how it all went down. And Pharaoh's daughter needs somebody to take. And she said, you can do it. I can go find. And so she brings Moses' mom to take care of him till about the age where he was weaned, which would be about five years old. And you find at the age of five, for the next 35 years, once he was weaned, his mom had to give him up. He lived in the palace and he lived in Egypt for the next 35 years. So let me ask you this, is five years of training enough to protect a guy for the next 35 years? Yeah, it is. Any kind of seeds you plant in your kids, whenever you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap everlasting life. Now you, you may not see the harvest, you may not see what the seeds are planted, but parents, you need to understand that the formative years of your kids are vital. They aren't to be neglected or ignored. Now, of course, if you look back and go, well, the formative years of my kids are already over. No, you can start at any time to pour into your kids, whatever their age, the truths of God's word. You you are the example. Kids learn more by what's caught than what's taught. And so the choice begins with us. But you look at Moses' life and you think, maybe in your own life, you'll look at the circumstances and just wonder, what, what is going on in my life? Is there any rhyme or reason to it all? Uh, you you got to put yourself in, in Moses' parents' life, like all that they're facing, stepping back and just thinking, what is going on in my life? We just want to raise a family. It's hard enough. It's hard enough in Egypt. It's hard enough losing everything. It's hard enough working 12, 14, 16, 18 hour days. It's hard enough to have taskmasters over us. It's hard enough to get more work and make it harder and have everyone turn against me. And now they're going to take my kid. And now I'm not going to see my son grow up and it's on. And you think, what is going on? Well, let me give you insight behind the scenes of what God is doing. Would you turn over to Jeremiah chapter 18? Jeremiah the prophet was given a specific instruction to go down to the potter's house because God wanted to show him how things work behind the scenes. Of course, Jeremiah is a prophet. He has a message for the nation of Israel, but but through this message, he also has an application for us that God is working behind the scenes. That even if we can't figure out the rhyme or reason of our lives, we don't know exactly what God's doing now and exactly what's happening here, we know 
that God is working things out. So notice in verse 1 of Jeremiah chapter 18. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I'll cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was, making something at the wheel. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. So here's the picture. This is a very familiar picture. We've even had potters on the stage giving us this illustration in real time for us, where you could see it with your own eyes. But here is the illustration. The potter represents God and his sovereign purposes. The wheel that's spinning represents life, represents the ups and downs of life, the circumstances of life. Don't, haven't you found over time that the circumstances of life can be very dizzying and where the wheel's faster, faster, faster. You guys slow down, slow down, but circumstances don't slow down like that. The wheel is in the control of the potter. And then that leaves you and me. Where do we fit in? Well, you are the lump of clay. That's what you are. We are big lumps. Except that we're valuable in the hands of the potter. And God is doing something. Notice it says in verse 3, that potter was making something. God is making something in your life. He is making something of you. You are in process. You are in process. You may not like where you're at. You may not appreciate what God is making, but you're in process. Not only that, notice there are times as God is making, verse 4, that the vessel he made of clay was marred. Circle that word marred right next to it, ruined. That Hebrew word can mean ruined. He was making something, and as he was making it, it's ruined. You, you walk in here today, you turn on your, your iPad, you're watching us online right now, you're flipping through the radio, and here you are listening to my voice, and, and you're thinking, my life is ruined. And that's how you walked in. My life is ruined. You look at the sum total of where you are today, the mistakes that you made, the things that might have been done to you, the bottom falls out economically, you know, financially, you can't make the bills, you were laid off, you, your spouse left you. you, you have made a mistake you don't think you're gonna recover from, and here you are, I'm ruined. Listen, as you're focusing on the ruinous debris of your life today, you have to remember that the sentence doesn't end there. The Bible says that the clay was marred in the hand of the potter. You're in the hand of the potter. And you're right, things didn't work out the way you thought they were. You're at this stage of life and you're like, you know, I thought things would be different by now. And I regret that decision. And now I've got this grief and I've got this tension. I've got this difficulty and I've got, and it's just ruined. I don't know what's going to, I don't know what's going to happen in my life. I don't know what's going to come out of this. I don't think anything's going to, I give up. I quit. No, 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 no. You've been marred, but you're in the potter's hands. He hasn't let go. Like, like you are safe and secure by faith in Jesus. You're in the potter's hands. Not only that, notice, as the potter notices the ruins of your life, it says that he made it again into another vessel. And isn't that true? Like, that, that just seems like life. You go from glory to glory, strength to strength. You go from one stage to another stage, and you, you, it seems like you take 10 steps forward, five steps back, and you're just going boom, boom, back and forth, back and forth. But the potter is making something. He is making something out of your life. And here's the thing. After a ruinous situation, you've got to submit to the last part of verse 4. You've got to understand that what God is making, what he is doing, what he's restoring is as it seems good to the potter to make. <laughs> it's good to the potter. It's good to the potter. God is working in you and, to, in you and in me for his good. Not necessarily everything that we want. And that's where we get super frustrated. I want this, I want this, I want this. And yet God's working in you what seems good to him. Church, you were bought with the price of the blood of Jesus Christ. You are owned 
by God. He's the overseer, the responsible party over your life. He knows what he's doing in your life. He knows what he's doing with the decisions, good and bad. He knows how to work things together. He knows that even if you were born into this family and you faced this difficulty and your parents did this and your friends did that and they turned on you and they posted this and you went through this and you're sad and you're hurting and I can't believe it all, you're in the potter's hands. And he's making you and me again into something that seems good to him. He wants to use us for his glory, his purposes, not our own. God is the creator. He's the sustainer of life. It starts with him, it ends with him, and everything in between is his. In Acts chapter 17, jot it down in verse 28, it says, for in him we live, we move, we have our being. And though this can be a little scary as the the wheel spins and wheel spins and wheel spins, it could be a little scary if you didn't know the character and nature of God. The God that transcends human government, the God that transcends human decisions, the God that transcends the economy, the God that transcends politics. He's the creator and, and we have nothing to be afraid of when we are in the potter's hands. You can trust him and you can yield to him. Wisdom from above, James teaches us, it includes a willingness to yield. And come back in Hebrews 11 because now in Moses' life we see it lived out in an episode in his life. It's glorious to know that God has us on a journey, just like Moses. Moses is on the same journey. He's learning how the pieces of his life are gonna fit together in the panorama, sovereign will of God. His parents launch him off as a baby on a river. Then he's saved, then he's rescued, then he's raised by his own mom in Pharaoh's house. Probably cared for till about five, spent the next 35 years in Pharaoh's court. But I can only imagine the conversations that mom had with her son, talking about creator God, talking about Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, teaching him about Noah, teaching about Abraham, Isaac, talking about a land, talking about a promise, talking about a savior, talking about being rescued. God is faithful. It's hard right now, but God is faithful. It's hard right now, but God loves you. It's hard right now, but he promised a savior. And I wonder if in those formative years in Moses' life that 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 seed planted about a savior did not take root in his heart and he sensed in his life, I think I might be the deliverer. Maybe God will use me that way. And there he is in Pharaoh's court being schooled in all the wisdom and all the opulence, all the luxury, all the education, not unlike Daniel, not unlike Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, learning the world and yet staying loyal to God. And it's possible to navigate in the world and stay loyal to God. You don't have to choose between the two. You can choose God and he'll enable you to be able to navigate in this world where he wants you. Now notice Moses, he comes of age. He comes of age and he receives an offer. The offer is, you can have all of Egypt. (laughs) What an offer. Now Josephus, the Roman historian, tells us that this particular Pharaoh did not have a male heir and that Moses was being prepared and prepped to be the heir and to take over Egypt. So this offer of Egypt wasn't a little portion. It wasn't a little bit of gold. It wasn't a little bit of silver. It wasn't like a little, he was being prepped to take over as the next Pharaoh. That's what's being offered to him. To to be in the lineage as a son of Pharaoh's daughter. And the first step in his mind was he refused it. I know what you're offering and I don't want it. Where did he get, where did he get the, the ability and the tenacity to refuse such an offer? Well, no doubt those foundational years in his life strengthened him and taught him to choose God over and above the things of this world. It seems, as a parent, it seems impossible. I mean, truly, it seems impossible. The way the world's going is like, I don't know. I mean, there are people right now thinking, I don't think I want to bring a child into this world because I don't know how I'm going to be able to raise them. Listen, God will enable you to raise them. You trust God with your kids. You trust God. You worship God. You trust God with your kids. He'll take care of them. He'll be with them. He'll help them, especially when they launch off and they're no longer under your care. God will take care of your kids. 
You just pour into them and be faithful as a parent or as a grandparent or as a great-grandparent or as an aunt or an uncle with your nieces, your nephews. The influence you have on kids, be faithful to pour into them in those foundational years. As he grows up around luxury and opulence, all that a man could want, he said no. The first thing he does is he refuses. Listen, when you say yes, and this is an important, this is an important truth, when you say yes to following Jesus Christ, on the flip side of that coin is a lot of no's. Now, unfortunately, in some churches, all the no's get emphasized. No, no, you just emphasize, I choose to follow Jesus. And along the path, with the temptations that come your way, you will learn to say no. Do you know one of the most powerful words in your vocabulary is the word no. It will save you from so much grief in this world. It will save you from so much pain in this world if you learn to use strategically the word no and you choose to follow in Moses' footstep and say, I refuse that. I don't want it. I won't take it. Moses was thinking here with the big picture in mind. He knew of a big God. And the idea behind this word refused and then in verse 25, choosing, has the idea of weighing in the balances. Which is what you and I do all the time. We don't think of the balances very much, but that's what we do. If you've ever taken out a sheet of paper and you've written a line down the middle and you write on one side the pros and on the other side the cons, this is what it's talking about. Where you're looking at, well, I'm weighing in and what should I, if I have all the opulence, you know, maybe I won't be able to lead people in worshiping God and he's weighing in in the balances and you can think like, like as I'm studying this, I'm reading it through and I'm slowing down to study it. I'm like, man, what would I do? I know what we say we do. What would you do, church? If you were given everything that you could possibly have, all the gold, silver, money in the world, what would you do? Would you choose affliction? <laughs> and then, I mean, think about it. Would you choose affliction and not everything in the world? It's like, ah, uh -huh. yeah, I would choose affliction. Amen, yes. You'd have good church language for that. But really, would you? I, I, I don't know what I would choose. I know what I would want to choose. I know that. I know, I know my desire would be to choose affliction. But I've experienced some serious affliction that I didn't choose. And to have the choice of saying, well, I'm going to give you a way out, Ed. The world says I'm going to give you a way out. It's sin, but it'll feel good. Because <laughs> sin does feel good, right? Did you know that? Sin is very attractive. It's very pleasurable. If it wasn't, nobody would sin. It wouldn't be a temptation. You see, what Moses was able to weigh, it says right here, if you turn the page on mine, it says, he chose affliction with the people of God, verse 25, than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Sin does bring pleasure, but it's passing. It's temporary. It's not worth it, although we stumble into sin all the time. So, so yeah, we, we have our church language. Let's put it into something, you know, because, I mean, seriously, we're never going to be offered Egypt. But so let's just say that the offer is on the table. I mean, literally, on the table. You could take it and walk out. $10 million. $10 million. Will you, will you choose $10 million, or will you choose to live a hard life following Jesus, a life of sacrifice, a life of surrender, a life of mockery, a life of reproach, a life of difficulty. What will you choose? $10 million. I mean, it's all there. One click of the button, it's in your account. If I did a survey right now, how many of you would choose to follow Jesus? Me, 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 me. But your other hand, maybe the $10 million. Maybe. Sounds like an easier life. And then some of you would even rash it. You're doing it right now. Well, I would choose both. Eh? They're on the table. I'll take them both. I'll be a nice Christian with $10 million. Okay, that's, human that's our humanity. It doesn't make you a bad person. But you've got to understand the weight of what Moses is doing here. He he's choosing to forgo 
all that a man or woman could want for the rest of their lives. And instead to stay loyal to God and to the people of God. He chose loyalty to God in the midst of great temptation. He had to first of all refuse, which then led to the choice. So let's bring it down a not, couple notches because those are pretty high. Let's bring it down a couple notches. Marie recently went to the market and she brought back these containers of Magnum ice cream. Now, if you haven't been introduced to Magnum ice cream, you need to go to Israel with us because they taste better in Israel than they taste here. So at every stop, there's a nice white chocolate, I, this vanilla ice cream wrapped in thick white chocolate. Mm, so good. The best of the best. So they're in, here, they're in the States now, but now they're in a container. So they take a container, they fill the inside with white chocolate, then they shoot the ice cream in the white chocolate, then a bit of big, then they put a big thick layer of white chocolate, and that is very tempting. Because I just told Marie that I'm, not, I'm cutting down on sugar for a while. So the girl doesn't just bring one of those containers, she brings two on either side of the, the freezer. And let's just say, in the container, it looks good. But in your mouth, it tastes good. Because I opened it, and I ate a little, little, little bit of it. It's so good. And so it's there mocking me every time I get the chicken out, every time I get the bacon out, everything. It's just mocking me. But I'm not throwing it away. Believe me, I'm not throwing it away. It's going to sit there and tempt me, the passing pleasures of Magnum ice cream. I'm going to tell you something that doesn't. It would never tempt me. If Marie put Brussels sprouts all over the house, <laughs> that's just sick. It's just like, who thought? It's like a deformed cabbage. Why? I don't care how much bacon you put on it. Like, that's nasty. I got ice cream, and I've got Brussels sprouts. Uh, you, you can fit whatever you want. You know, rhubarb. What's that all about? That's from the curse. These are like from the curse. And if you put those two together, like, of course I'm choosing. Of course I'm choosing the ice cream. Of course. Of course I'm going to take. I know I'm going to pay a price later. I know I have to work out a little bit more. Maybe my goals will be delayed. I, I know maybe my sh blood sugar will go. I know I'm going to choose that. Brussels, seriously. Why? That's no temptation to me. It's no temptation to most of you either, given the same opportunity. But Moses, he's, he's faced with real temptation. And it's the difference between choosing ice cream and some nasty, deformed mini cabbage. Who does that? Who would choose that over ice cream? And don't raise your hand. I don't want to know about it. You need extra counseling. Like that's just, you got to work with me on the illustration. They were just like, that's just, that's just wrong. That's just wrong. And it would have been wrong for Moses to say, you know what? There's a lot of people here. God could use somebody else here. I know what mom taught me, but I'm going to take, I'm all in with Egypt. And maybe I can use all of Egypt for the, for the helping my people. But he knew that his choice did not involve a third option. It's follow Jesus or don't follow him. He refused, he chose, and then notice he also esteemed Again, that's where we get the idea of weighing. He esteemed. That means he placed a high value on the reproach of Christ. Now, how could, he, how could he place a high value on the reproach of Christ? Jesus hasn't even come yet. It hasn't even been developed. Moses hasn't even written the Bible yet because he writes the first five books of the Old Testament. How can he talk about Christ? Well, that seed of the Messiah. We, we learn of Messiah back in Genesis. We know about the coming Savior he, back in Genesis. He hasn't have it all laid out, but he knew this. Following God brought reproach. Following God brought reproach. In a very small way, we're being tempted in that on ourselves. There's a little bit of pressure, a little bit of restriction, a little bit of warfare in the church, and you find we're going to fight the man and we're going to fight it and we're going to stand for our rights and we're going to choose validation from Egypt? 
I don't need validation from Egypt. God validates his church. He created the church. Government didn't create the church. God created the church. I have no ability to fight for my rights. I gave up my rights when I chose to follow Jesus Christ. I refused. I lived in this world. I refused this world. And I chose to live close to Jesus, which brings a lot of affliction, a lot of opposition, a lot of pressure, a, a lot of choices. Not only that, but I've esteemed over the years, I've esteemed over the years that the reproaches of Christ, like, like he says here in verse 26, the reproaches of Christ are better than any riches that I could get in this world. And, and we're, we're finding a small little temptation for us as a church right now. We're, we're finding being tested on this very thing. Look, the way of the cross is affliction. The way of the cross is reproach. It's not getting your way all the time. It's not comfortable. It's not easy. You, you think the current condition of your life right now, the current condition of our culture right now, the current condition of the world right now, you, if you think it's not going to get any worse, you just haven't read your Bible. It's going to get worse. And we may live through it. We may be in the middle of it. And in for the, after the rapture of the church, it's going to get really bad, which I don't think we'll be here for that. But see, the Lord is preparing us for what's up ahead. He's training us now for what's up ahead. He's drawing out from us. He's shaking everything that can be shaken so the things that can't be shaken will stand. He's, we're in the refiner's fire and things are being burned away in our flesh. And let me tell you that we're on edge. I mean, many of us are on edge. I'll speak for myself. We're on edge. I, we had a situation yesterday with one of the brothers here. He's coming in, taking care of things, but things are changed here because we're rearranging the whole building, getting ready for school, social distancing, this. So we're trying to do our best to be above reproach. But he comes in, he goes, I can't work with this. And I'm getting these texts in there and the pastor getting involved. And, and I could tell he was frustrated. I know him personally. I've known him for 19, 20 years. So I know he's getting frustrated. And I'm like, it's going to be okay. We're going to work through this. Thanks for your patience. And then maybe two or three hours later, he says, I'm sorry, Ed, I was in the flesh. Yeah, I could tell just, I wasn't there, but I could tell through text that you were aggravated. I could tell. And it's okay. We're all aggravated. And, but I, I shared with him just a little bit of insight. I said, take what you were feeling and multiply it by 10,000. I just made the number up. 10,000. And that's the world that I've been living in for the last five, six, eight, 12 weeks, and then in other parts of my life, um, years. And we just seem to be on edge. Anybody else on edge a little more than usual? Anybody? Because like in all the other services, they're looking at me, what a bad pastor you are. But are we in this together? Like it just doesn't, ta it just takes nothing to put us over the edge. You're like, what's happening? It's hard right now. And it's hard to make the choice, I choose affliction. Who in the world, in their right mind, chooses affliction? I'll tell you, it's not a rhetorical question. The man, the woman that walks by faith, that's who. As I shared earlier, you know, I've, I faced affliction that wasn't my choice. And I just like, no, nah, no, nah, I don't want any more trouble in my life. I've even said that out loud. I bet you if you look through my diary, you know, as I'm my prayer journal, I bet you more than one time, I don't want any more. I don't want any more. I don't want it. God knows I don't want any more. But I'm the clay on the wheel. Where? In the potter's hands. And so I would do well to choose what God has chosen for me. You would do well to choose what God has chosen for you. And you say, well, Ed, how will I know that? It will come with the options. You will have a choice of the world and the culture, or you will have a choice to follow God. And as you choose to follow God, you'll have to refuse things. And you'll have to esteem things. And then follow through in obedience. As Moses weighs out his life, he follows through what Jesus taught in Luke 14. He's counted the cost. He chose affliction with his people. He chose to suffer with them rather than enjoy a life 
of no suffering while he watches his own. He stayed loyal to God and therefore loyal to one another. As he walked by faith, he was built up and strengthened. He could refuse the world. Jot it down, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. He's following through what was ye- written years later when John says, don't love the world or the things in the world because the things that are in the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There's competing loves. You can't do both. Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. You've got to choose. Over and over the Bible says, choose you this day whom you'll serve, Joshua says. But as for me and my house, I'm serving the Lord. And I don't care what it costs. I know it's going to be painful. I don't even know how painful it's going to be. But when I get to that pain, I know that God will meet me there because I'm the clay. Where? In the potter's hands. Moses' life was laid out for him. And as he cooperated with God, he's in the hall of faith. (laughs) We don't have the chapter of Moses saying, oh, he chose Egypt. Because if he did choose Egypt, let's just say he did, he wouldn't be in the hall of faith, but someone else would be because God will accomplish his purposes with or without us. I was just thinking recently, I was just thinking, man, God could do what he wants to do in Colorado with or without us. I just want him, I just want to do, I just want to be a part of what he's doing. I don't want to be the without, I want to be the with. I want my life to align with him so that we're as a church, and that, that's kind of how, how the overall direction of our church has been for 20 years, but through every crisis as God's got us to one, to another, another, is the long game, not the short game. It's the long game. It's the people we're gonna meet. It's the testimony we have in the community. It's the power of God resting upon the weakness of man, not the power of man. Even if we were to win something, what have we won? We want to see people won to Christ. We want to see hearts won over. We want to see the brokenhearted healed. We want to see those divided reconciled. We want to see people walk through. We want to see lives saved. And we don't want to get caught up with the love of this world, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh. You have to make a choice. You know it's been said that you make your choices, then your choices make you. It's true. Your life to this point is a summary of the choices you've made, the responses that you had. Sometimes it gets so hard and so difficult that you react, and that's rarely good. (laughs) Rarely good as a quick reaction. Sometimes it's okay. You know, it's like the reflexes that were really good got out of danger or something, but rarely in regular life does reaction actually lead to spiritual growth, but a measured response, surrendered to the Holy Spirit, is a good thing, but it's counterintuitive. It's counter-cultural. You know, the the hatred that's coming to the church today that's just surfacing in our country, but in other countries it's already, but the hatred is not actually toward the church. You know that. You know what the Bible says. Jesus said this, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. That's what he said. He says, the hatred that you're experiencing is that cosmic battle between good and evil, between the devil and Jesus Christ, truly. And a hatred toward Jesus spills over. But the problem is, is we don't like to be hated. We don't like opposition. We really don't even like things not going our way. So we jump in and we want to take control and we want to make our own choices and we want to choose, well, I'll mix it here and I'll do this and I'll take this and that way it'll give me temporary comfort but we'll miss the bigger picture of what God's really wanting to do by bringing discomfort into your life. By, by bringing it to a place where you have to choose. The choices you make today will affect you in this life and in the life to come. They affect your friends. Your choices affect your family, even your descendants, even your single day. Well, I don't don't know. I don't have any kids or anything. No, no, no. Your life affects many people for the cause of Christ or not. And the decisions you make today, listen, you've got to receive this before we leave. The decisions you make today will absolutely 100% affect your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, and beyond. Every decision 
your marriage, the choice of obedience or disobedience, your singleness, who you are at work, who you are in your community, you will pass these things on, every choice. Choices are important. Consider this. Back in the 19th century, in the 1800s, there were two men, both living in New York. One was named Max Jukes. The other, his name was Jonathan Edwards. You Bible students might know Jonathan Edwards as a very successful pastor and preacher. Max Jukes lived in New York and he didn't believe in Jesus. Neither did he believe in raising his kids to believe in God. So much so that even in an era and a time where everybody went to church no matter what, when his kids asked to go to church, he wouldn't even take his kids there. And he raised his kids in such a way to be against God, not for God. Well, those that study these things found that Max Jukes had 1,026 descendants. 300 of them were sent to prison. 190 of them became prostitutes. 680 of them were admitted alcoholics. And his family cost the state of New York in excess of $420,000 in 1800s. In today's dollars, that they were a drain on society to the millions, double digits at least, taking, taking, taking in the prison system, on the streets, finding themselves as a drain on society, living desperate, difficult lives under the influence of alcohol. They made no contrib contribution to society whatsoever that we know of. A godless man leaving a godless legacy. On the other hand, contrast him with Jonathan Edwards. He lived in the same state at the same time as Max did. He loved the Lord and made sure his kids were with him and his wife in church every Sunday, discipled his kids, doing exactly what we're talking about here. They found that he had 929 descendants at the time of the study. 430 of them were called to full-time ministry. 86 became university professors. 13 became university presidents. 75 became authors writing valuable books. Seven were elected to United States Congress. One of his descendants was the vice president of the United States of America. Edward's family never cost the state one dime. Why? Because of choices. Just the choice in front of you. In our culture today, it's all about immediate gratification immediate satisfaction. But you got to think long term, church. You got to think the long game. Your decisions today are going to have ramifications in the future. However the long waits to, however long he delays is coming, you know, we're waiting for the rapture, we're waiting for the return of Christ. Until then, your choices matter. You got to see the big picture. It's just not about you alone. Your life affects all your descendants. It's about you and your children and your children's children and their children and all the people that you will impact. It's about the legacy you're leaving. You know, a lot of people are afraid of legacy because it's so imposing. It's like the big, like legacy. How could I ever leave a legacy? Don't let it overwhelm you. Here's how you leave a legacy. By today's choice and another choice and another choice. The sum total of a legacy is a series of choices. I, I think of how rapid, how instantly God turned my family around. As I was born again, my wife was born again, everything changed. Everything changed in an instant. I would walk into a room like this, lost, overcome by drugs and alcohol, got my wife ready to leave me. I, 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 I walked in, a me like it was, it, I was on the way to having descendants that would just be another statistic. But God, God's able to work on the inside. He's able to change the whole course of history by you, by you. The whole course of history changes by your connection with him. You change everything. You can change everything downward with your kids, grandkids. You can change things upward as you begin to share the love and mercy and grace with your family going both ways. Moses stands as a testimony today of his choices. He wasn't a perfect man. None of us are. But man, he was remembered because he learned how to refuse, he learned how to choose, and he learned how to esteem. I love it. Which way will you go? God gives you a book. 
He gives you the book. It reveals his character and his nature. It reveals his will, his desires for you. He gives you the spirit, the internal power that helps you and me grow. And these choices really are made in the privacy of your own heart. We don't get to see them. We get to see the results, but we don't get to see what happens personally. This happens in the privacy of your home. It happens when you're alone in the car. It happens when you are at work and being in, it happens in the personal private parts of your life. And Moses by faith says, I choose the eternal. I choose God. It means I'm gonna suffer now. It means I'm not gonna have everything that I want. It means that it's gonna be difficult for me, but I choose the afflictions with the people of God than the passing pleasures of sin. And it doesn't sound like, I don't know, I don't know, passing, I, I, choosing affliction, choosing, no. You're, you're really, really what's happening is you're choosing to identify with Jesus Christ. I'm gonna be with the junior hires this Friday when we go to their retreat. I get to do Friday night, get to kick it off, and I'm gonna be talking to the kids about identity and encourage them to identify with Jesus at this young age. It's gotta happen that it's worth following it's not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging. There will be affliction. There will be reproach. People will bully them, make fun of them, try to talk it out. Like all of that is true. It's true. It's true. But God is greater even in the affliction. And afflictions grow your faith. Listen, church, for those that are adults, it's never too late to make the right choice. It's never too late to change course in your life. Never, ever, never. Let Moses encourage you. We're not even done with Moses, right? We're not even done. There's still more to learn. Here in, in Hebrews 11, there's still more that we're going to learn. But today we learn it started with a choice. How do I have the testimony? How do I make it into the hall of faith? How do I have a testimony like Moses? Make the right choice now. That's all you got to just right now. Yeah, but it's another now. Make another choice. It's another now. Make another choice. It's the sum total of your choices that leaves a legacy, good or bad to your family and friends. So Father, thank you for the, this word. And man, I'm so encouraged by the hall of faith. Like we're, we're, just, we're just so <clears throat> excited about what you're doing. Uh, we're so excited about what you want to accomplish. We're so excited what you're doing in the church, what you're stirring up in us, the faith, the trust, the, the, the joy, the challenges that the refiners fire. Now we... You know, we don't like to be marred. Who does? And I know I would need the grace of God to choose affliction. I know it. But I have the grace of God. And I'm thankful for the grace of God. And I pray that over our church today. I pray it over the church at large. But our little family here, the little field that you've allowed me to be a part of, I pray you would stir and strengthen and encourage that we wouldn't be easily distracted or sidetracked that we would major on love that we would be a people of agape that, that we would encourage we would see and value one another that we wouldn't be so quick to judge or be hypercritical of one another but just to acknowledge we're all in process we're all on the wheel we're all in the potter's hands he's forming us he's fashioning us he's molding us and for that we're grateful and so may you have your way with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together, church.